Good afternoon. I'd like to thank the organizers uh, for uh, having me here at the conference. Uh, I'm going to talk about a topic that I think we've already discussed at the meeting, uh, which is uh, powerful uh, systems, uh, and in particular, you know, Heisenberg anti ferromagnetic version of powerful systems. Uh, but I'll be focusing on a new class of materials, uh, the fluorine powerful materials. Um, Scattering. Here we give you the parameters for the distillation using source. 
And so this is a, um, a copy through uh, a mental space. It's an elastic scatter, a dominant space. So this machine has uh, rejects most of the elastic scatter. And so when you see a brand these sharp spots, but also these extended features that show that there are some static aspects of this material that actually uh, are not consistent with translational symmetry. And you see already now that this actually differs uh, for the Hegel case and for the Mendes case. But this is so you can calculate from there. We have two arms that are almost the same. They're really close in size, but they do have different charges, one plus to two plus. Um, you get this kind of pattern. Sodium strontium uh, is also one and two plus, but there there's actually quite a big size discrepancy between the two sides. So there's certainly some form of disorder in the system. Uh, we're still working on understanding the full uh, extent of this. But what I'd like to say is that um, this necessarily is a correlated uh, farm uh, disorder. So the exchange is going to be disordered. Uh, we think it's at the percent level, and we get that estimate from looking at the uh, low uh, uh, freezing temperatures in the compound. But it is going to be a correlated exchange disorder uh, because the disordered site sits in these uh, hexagonal voids, if you will, to be um, in the um, particle structure, the structure of the corner So you can get. You may have kind of wings that will be different from other wings depending on what charge you put in that side. So it's certainly going to be correlated in some way. And as you can see here, the sodium calcium is also um, correlated. Uh, so it's going to be an interesting um, uh, and sort of different actually from a totally random disorder for sure. Okay, so now I'm going to go in and look at the individual compounds. The first is easy plane system sodium, uh, sodium calcium cobalt uh, chloride. Here's the actual. Stability and uh, the low temperature freezing phenomenon that you see either in the application uh, zero fuel cool field cool or in uh, AC stability. And the freezing temperature is uh, <coughs> more common and used for future analysis. Uh, it's not a long range order, but there's actually um, uh, basically a uh, kind of a compensation of the, um, of the gamma 5 state of the XY antiferromagnet into the short range order. Um, here's actually uh, for an overview um, um, plot of all of the uh, all of the elastic scattering, um, and you see an interesting kind of transition um, in the character of this of these correlations. So that when you're at really low energies in the, in the elastic regime, you know, this keeps coming up. That's the short range version of this uh, this elastic order. Uh, then you uh, at relatively low energies, you have sort of two branches that from each other, and that's the feature of the intermediate regime. And then as you come up to high energies, these two branches actually come together and, and, and meet. Um, this is uh, an analysis that, that Kate Ross did, uh, where you actually um, are able to um, model quite nicely uh, each of these different regimes. Um, the uh, the uh, intermediate regime, if I was to look at that, that corresponds to basically having all sorts of uh, arrangements of spins uh, where each tetraethon has has a uh, net oven on it, and where all the spins lie in these uh, uh, easy planes. Uh, and then you generate this kind of structure. Um, it turns out we have to add in a little bit of the gamma um, line, a little bit of the collinear antiferromagnet uh, to account for features of this regime. And then as you go to higher energies, not that it's a particularly favored state configuration, but the high energy excitations correspond to generate uh, these uh, 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 collinear uh, antiferromagnetic. So a really short range correlated state dominated by easy plane, um, by easy plane and soccer. Uh, you could ask why don't we have actually order uh, to the system? Uh, because um, um, if you talk to theorists who analyze the uh, classical regime, this is um, this is sort of a semi-classical regime, and there should be order from disorder, both from thermal fluctuations, or in fact also from random disorder. Um, but we don't see actually uh, long range order developing. And one of the things we could, uh, we could think to be the reason for that uh, could be the correlated na nature of the disorder in the system. It's not taken into account as far well as I understand with that uh, order from disorder uh, analysis. And here's actually the, um, the, the, the picture to remind us of, this, uh, of the correlated nature of the, of the disorder. Um, we saw it in the diffuse scattering. Uh, we, uh, we don't actually have a full analysis of that yet, but we anticipate that there will be potentially a massive, oh, sorry, a, a spin ice type charge um, correlation take, taking place, and that will then be 
uh, potentially the reason that this system is not able to enter uh, enter a solid state, nonetheless. Next, I'd like to go to the Heisenberg limit, uh, and both of the next compounds will be uh, the Heisenberg compounds, uh, both the classical case and the, the quantum case. Um, and so, in the, in the, in the, uh, in the case of the Nickel compound, I think most of this you've, you've seen, so I don't want to uh, spend too long, but I think I'd like to contrast it with the magnet case. Um, so in the nickel uh, compound, um, there's, uh, there's, there's a very nice method uh, that the Kemp developed to actually extract uh, the exchange constants in the field of the position money. And they were able to, using M Shu Zhang, I should say, they were able to use a Gaussian approximation to calculate the equal time correlation function and then compare that to the measured data and adjusting the exchange constants learned that actually this is very much uh, a Heisenberg near neighbor antichromagnetic interaction with some further neighbor interactions and some anisotropy with it as well. But mostly strong near neighbor Heisenberg uh, antichromagnetic interactions. So, really, exactly the compound you might add not be this little element of disorder that we have to worry about. So, as you come up, um, uh, as you come up in energy, if you energy resolve these features in uh, the low energy regime, you see these pitch point features that. Um, that we are familiar with as indicators of the uh, satisfied local antichromagnetic constraint. Coming up in energy, these uh, pitch point regimes uh, get broader, and then eventually at high energies, uh, all of the momentum space is filled up except the gamma points uh, where we cannot have scattered due to uh, the, um, the approximate rotational symmetry of the Hamiltonian. You can take the same data and project it as function of momentum and energy, and we see really broad features um, here, uh, which actually some of reminiscent of what we see in, in, um, in uh, certified spin liquid systems, such as the spin one half chain. Uh, but here we talk about a spin one three dimensional frustrated um, uh, magnet. Uh, it has kind of a vestige of dispersive character too, if you come up, uh, if you come up in energy. But the feature that we're most excited about and where we uh, put our faith is that, uh, in fact, uh, the highest intensity regime in this um, particular plot actually occurs at a finite energy at the scale of the exchange constant in the system, at the scale of the isotropic antichromagnetic exchange constant. So uh, this maximum we don't think can arise due to um, uh, due to sick line or exchange anisotropy, uh, and uh, we're wondering if that could be an indication of the uh, quantum fluctuation effect in this uh, in this um, in the system. And so this is where it becomes interesting actually to compare to the classical system with manganese, and we'll find that it actually does behave uh, quite uh, quite differently. But first, I'd like to uh, just uh, remind you of the freezing that eventually takes place in every single of these systems, including the, the nickel system. And this is the AC susceptibility, uh, which one, one actually sees the current part of that with the elastic magnetic scattering. Um, and from that, we can, uh, we can learn um, something about the, uh, the impacts of the uh, anisotropic and further neighbor interactions um, in the system. Um, the stability heat kind of plays out the whole story, uh, having a high temperature, a classic regime, a quantum uh, spin liquid regime, and then a classic regime at the, uh, the very lowest temperatures. Um, okay, so finally I want to come to the magnetic case. Um, uh, so this is also an isotropic, um, isotropic type system, and uh, so stability uh, looks pretty much like a Nickel compound, uh, the ice temperature is similar actually to the, to the nickel compound. The freezing temperature, not that, uh, not that different. Also, frequency dependent, uh, dependence in the freezing uh, process. Um, and now we're going to analyze this uh, this system uh, using a neutron scatter. This is the uh, dynamic correlation function. Uh, this compound is a function of energies of 0, 1, 2, and 3 millielectric volts. And we immediately begin to see some. Differences beyond the fact that it's very pink. Uh, but uh, uh, here, for example, you see um, at the 200 and 020 uh, locations, uh, there's quite an accumulation of intensity. And that actually corresponds to a frozen component uh, of, of the scattering uh, and a correlation length in the range around 15, uh, around 15 angstrom. And this is quite different from the quantum case of spin 1. Uh, there we didn't have any of that. It was all diffuse um, in, in the elastic chain. Was freezing, uh, but it's completely diffuse in the elastic channel. So here, uh, some sort of quasi, uh, quasi, 
sort of relative to the short range order, but otherwise, I mean, it seems to know where it wants to go to land in space in that, that particular location. Um, so when you look at the temperature dependence of the intensity um, at this point, you see that it, it does in fact turn on uh, from cooling this fashion. And if you remember, the freezing temperature was around 2.6 Kelvin. So this is happening at significantly higher temperatures. This is, this is the AC, so stability anomaly is at this temperature approximately. This is not very unusual for these kinds of things. Uh, the energy scale that you're looking at here is, is in the range of um, uh, in the range of uh, two or three, uh, two or three Kelvin, okay, maybe uh, about three Kelvin. So this actually is a much much coarser frequency scale than uh, corresponds to the uh, corresponds to the AC sensitivity. Um, now let's now make direct comparisons between the nickel and manganese case. Um, so uh, so we have the the, uh, the classical situation on the left, the, the quantum situation on the right. Uh, though I have to, of course, say that these compounds are significantly distinguished uh, both in terms of the natural disorder and also in terms of uh, weak, longer range and anisotropic terms in the interaction. So these are certainly also at play, um, but we're interested in the possibility that quantum fluctuations may also play a role in distinguishing these, uh, these different compounds. And certainly this looks quite, uh, quite different. Uh, and now I'm going to compare um, the um, the excitations part of the quantum momentum and energy transfer, and uh, I'll lay out put it side by side so you can look at it. But it is a very similar plot to what we did uh, in the Nagel case. Uh, once again, you have very, very broad, diffusive features of functional energy and momentum transfer. Uh, but the thing that we've actually gone through is that uh, in this case, um, the highest intensity occurs uh, at, uh, as you come down to the low energy, there's never a finite energy maximum at this, uh, at this uh, 200 location. Um, and if I, we can show that if we do a constant function of energy in these three locations, uh, you can see the dispersive peak. Uh, this, this feature is, is never really uh, has a dip in it at all. So even if you take into account the, the different energy scales of the two compounds, uh, then these are actually uh, distinguishable. Um, you might ask, why is it when I have the same period of ice temperature Bandwidth is all the way down to four million here. Uh, it was it was uh, larger uh, by uh, quite a bit, up to ten million, like in the Nagel case. Uh, that's because the uh, the uh, spin quantum number enters into the device temperature um, uh, differently than the bandwidth of the excitation. So that's that's kind of another feature uh, of having a different spin quantum number. But I'm going to eventually compare the classical case directly to the quantum case here. So this is the this is the manganese. Half. This is the nickel spin one, and you'll see that there's this uh, interesting uh, distinction uh, that we actually have a finite energy maximum for the nickel case. And just to remind you again, um, this we don't believe that this could be an effect of anisotropy, um, and the reason for that is that the um, uh, is that the analysis of the equal time correlation function um, shows that the anisotropy terms are actually very weak in this compound, um, and they would not be able to produce a Finite energy maximum at the scale of the, of the bare exchange constant, which is which is approximately four four million which is involved in the system. So there's a clear difference between these two. Uh, differences in interaction disorder may play a role, uh, and we'll work to quantify that. Um, I wanted to mention, and I know that the audience that might be able to take your questions in the coffee break, is that astronomical power simulations on um, this system actually don't produce a finite energy peak. Classical method, even though they can account for things like specific heat at high temperatures, they can't actually account for this particular feature in the data. Then I'd like to summarize um, and to say that uh, we have this new family of horrible four eyes that we're quite excited about. Um, they do have the, uh, the issue of the uh, amount of disorder uh, in them, uh, but we want to turn that around to be something interesting actually. We can make lemonade and lemons, and the point is that uh, these are actually. Uh, these have the character of a correlated disorder. Uh, we think that that's something that we haven't seen so much uh, direct effort going into the thinking about that. Uh, and uh, we're going to continue to get more detailed information incrementally. Um, and then, of course, the other feature that we're looking at, we don't have a kind of conclusive statement on that, but we're interested in the possibility that quantum effects might be involved in the 
live in three dimensions and just get one uh, because of this one consideration. Thank you for your attention. I, I would 
start with say that this this lovely regime here uh, from from uh, fractional middle electric mode and down that's probably heavily influenced by this order, but I uh, I would think that this is this is more than just regime. One more question over here. Uh, so you mentioned cobalt uh, in the next slide. So it's a base slide.